Okay then, so this session is to talk about the central stars of the Northern Hemisphere. Because we're looking at Celtic mysticism, Celtic mythology, the Celts of course live on the Northern Hemisphere of the planet, so the stars that they knew and their mythology is all relative to the Northern Hemisphere stars. Now, <clears throat> one way of working with the Oum as a system of 20 trees is that the Oum creates a year wheel. That is the, the circle of the year is divided into 20 different trees. A bit like having 12 months or 12 zodiac signs with the Oum, there's 20 pieces of cake, each one belonging to a different tree. So we talked about this in our last session, or I talked about it, and you can find that on the YouTube channel. It's the clip for the Days of Oak. So if you look for the Days of Oak, which was only about a week ago, uh, I give a, an explanation there about the sun's ecliptic and how the year can be divided into two halves of six months or four quarters or eight Celtic festivals and different ways of dividing the year that the ancient people used. Um, so that allows you to work with the Oum as a metaphysical uh, psychic grove in your head. And it also allows you to create a sacred space in your ritual room or sacred landscape or wherever. You know, it's a very common idea amongst Western magical traditions of calling in the four quarters, for instance. So it's just expanding on that, you know, your sacred circle or your medicine wheel or your Oum grove is wherever you are aligned to north, south, east, west or different times of the year. Now. This topic doesn't have a time of year because it's constant, it's ever present. And so then I thought, well, when are we gonna talk about it? And well, now we're talking about it now because we're in the quarter of the Oum that relates to the May Queen, uh, the goddess of nature, if you like. And that's gonna make a lot of sense with the central stars. Although her tree, if you like, the hawthorn tree, has already passed her, her little section of the year. And then the Oak and the Holly King are gonna battle at May Day for her hand in marriage and all, all of that sort of stuff. But, but equally the mother goddess or the sovereignty goddess is ever present because she relates to one of the circumpolar constellations. Uh, and this is backed up with authentic Celtic archeology span and stuff. So, just to recap then, this is a handy little thing. This is a Philips planisphere. I ripped the top bit off. You can turn a wheel around and see different stars for the time of the year, but I wanted the whole map, if you like. So very simplistically, uh, the outer circle can be seen as the sun visiting all 12 zodiac signs throughout the year. Or you don't even have to think of zodiac signs. You can think winter solstice, spring equinox, summer solstice, autumn equinox, and, and it repeats and stuff. And so for the Oum, the circumference is 20 trees around in a circle. Now, with um, all magical things, using a sacred medicine wheel or sacred circle, you're looking at a circumference, but of course there's a whole load of stars in the middle of it all. Now, some of these stars come and go throughout the seasons of the year. It's like they dip below the horizon at one time of the year, and then those dip below the horizon at another time of the year, and those dip below the horizon. So some of the stars are seasonal, that is they come and go, but they come back at the same time every year. But the, the ones in the middle, are ever present. They're the circumpolar stars. 
and here's how it works then. So we did this on the Days of Oak video. This is the sun and this is planet Earth. And it takes planet Earth the whole year to go around the sun. And it creates the illusion, optical illusion, that the sun is traveling around the stars, where it is, relatively speaking, it stays where it is. And it's Earth looking at the sun that makes the sun look like it's traveling around. So that, that optical illusion of the sun going through the circumference of stars is called the sun's ecliptic or the sun's path or the golden wheel, well, different names for it. And the zodiac divides it into 12, the oem divides it into 20. And, and there's even bigger divisions than 20, which I'll, I'll come to. But we're not looking at that circle. This, this circle is the circumference. Now, what also happens is as Earth is going around the sun, Earth itself is spinning, spinning around on its own axis. And this creates another optical illusion of a pole star directly above it. But the Earth is at a slight angle, so it, it wobbles like a spinning top. You know, so as it's going around the sun, it's, it's also looking at pole stars with it and traveling around. So those pole stars are always there, even as the seasonal stars come and go. Now, <clears throat> for the Northern Hemisphere then, a simplified version is this map from one of my books. So this light blue streak going up, there's a section of the Milky Way. And in the winter time, we have an asterism or a star pattern called the winter hexagon. And it sits on the Milky Way like this. And the predominant constellations of the winter hexagon are Orion the hunter and Taurus the bull. And this iconography is in lots of ancient mystery school teachings, okay? But simplistically, they're the winter stars. They're in the night sky throughout the winter months around winter solstice, the months leading to and the months after. The opposite time of the year, the other end of the Milky Way is a triangle of stars. It's known as the summer triangle and symbolically it's three birds. The three birds are Cygnus the swan, Aquila the eagle and Lyra the harp. Lyra was also seen as a falling uh, eagle or a falling vulture, a smaller bird than the swan and the eagle, but three birds. Uh, so that symbolism of three birds is repeated. And in Welsh mythology, they're the birds of Rhiannon, the summer triangle. So you've got the summer stars and you've got the winter stars and they come and go or go up and down above the horizon throughout the turning of the year. But in the middle, on the Milky Way, you see the pale blue river. So between the summer stars and the winter stars, there's a W-shaped constellation on the Milky Way. And that's a constellation that we now call Cassiopeia from uh, Greek mythology, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail further on. <clears throat> the other circumpolar stars are Draco the dragon and the big bear and the little bear. Uh, Americans call the big bear the big dipper, you know? Um, but it's two bears and a dragon and the W shape Cassiopeia are the circumpolar stars. So they're the central stars that are always there, ever present all year round. <clears throat> now, here's a nice thing. It's this snake or a dragon, and there's a little bear and a big bear. And it looks like the yin and yang symbol of China, of Taoism, you know? But this is a Romano-Celtic from Gaul, uh, third century Romano-Celtic Gaul. 
Um, it's the center of a star map, but it's Draco the dragon, the big bear and the little bear. And they're stylized to look like that yin and yang symbol. Now, <clears throat> the dragon was really important right back to the uh, Bronze Age. And the reason for that is that as planet Earth spins and goes around the sun, it points to the North Pole axis, if you like, and but it wobbles. So at the moment, uh, the pole star is Polaris of the little bear. But over many, many thousands of years, there's a little wobble um, because the pole does this. And at the moment, it's aligned with Polaris of the little bear. But in the Bronze Age, it was aligned to Thuban and Draco. So the celestial dragon held the North Pole in the Bronze Age. And now in our age, the little bear holds the North Pole. And over many, many thousands of years, it will go to Lyra the Harp and some other, uh, other stars. There's seven pole stars that take millennia, millennia, millennia to, to just do one wobble of the North Pole axis, if you like. But for the Bronze Age and the early Iron Age, there's this celestial dragon law that's carried on by generations, e even after the pole has shifted from the dragon to the little bear, the symbolism of the dragon at the center of everything is still there in lots of old mythologies. So for instance, China with its yin and yang uh, symbolism, the symbol of the emperor is the celestial dragon and the emperor's palace is in the center of the kingdom and he's personifying that dragon thing in the center of the land. And there's no surprise there because China is under the same Northern hemisphere constellations as the Celtic world. So they're different parts of the globe, but the same heavenly dome, if you like. So there's a story in the Mabinogion of uh, Tleith and Clefelis and um, cutting the story short, uh, the king of Britain, Leith, is being troubled by two dragons that scream every Beltane and terrify everybody. And he goes to his brother and his brother explains how you've got to draw the dragons down into the center of your kingdom. Now, hang on, there's a dragon energy being drawn down into the center of the kingdom. So it's a garbled story of remembering Bronze Age star law, you know, and then the dragons are concealed in Wales and so on. But the simple thing of drawing the dragons down into the center of your kingdom is the nux there. Now, little drawing here from one of my books. It's a Roman cavalry rider. He's sitting on his horse, he's got a shield in his hand and he's holding a dragon head on a pole. Now, his name in the Roman cavalry was a Draconarius, and he was the battle standard bearer for the cavalry of the Romans. Now, you've got to remember that the Brythonic Celts were Romanized for four centuries, and by the time you get to Taliesin, King Arthur, Merlin, and all of those guys, you're in Dark Age Britain, and the, they've inherited these Roman military methods, methodologies, tactics and strategies and, and how to fight in the first place, you know. So simplifying it then, the Roman cavalry, wherever the Draconarius dragon head battle banner went, all the other cavalry would follow. Draco in the center of the night sky, all of the other constellations circling around it. So it was a simple way of leading the cavalry wherever you needed them. And that finds its way into Arthurian stories of the pen dragon, the dragon's head, you know, and it being the symbol of Arthur and his knights, the, the cavalry, the, the horse people, you know. And um, it carried on for a long, long time. There's the wonderful 
tapestry of the Norman invasion of Britain, the Bayeux tapestry. And there's even then in what's that 1066 and onwards, there's embroidered a battle banner of the Draconarius. The dragon head is there on the Bayeux tapestry. So it lasted a long time. By the time the first Arthurian romances were being written down, this Draco cavalry battle banner thing had continued from Roman times onwards, you know. So then in those stories, uh, each army, because they're still doing things the way it was done in the Roman Empire, was personified as one dragon fighting another dragon, you know, one cavalry army fighting another cavalry army. So it, symbolically, it was these two dragons fighting and, and that becomes loaded with mes uh, metaphysical esoteric ideas like the Caduceus and Mercury and, and interplay of the Winter King and Summer King and all, all of those things. But it does have origins in Roman cavalry practices, the origin of which was Draco, the dragon at the center of the starry night sky as well, you know. <clears throat> so here's the yin and yang, simplistic Romanized Celtic thing. Now you won't be able to see the next diagram so well, but this disc of the two bears and the dragon is the center of this design. Now I'll put this on the Facebook group later. This, you can look it up as well. It's kept at the Louvre in France, the, the museum, the Louvre. Um, it's called the Bianchini tablet. And it was, it's from like third century Roman Gaul and the darker orange bits in the middle are all that survives. Uh, they pieced them together. All the bits were found broken up, thrown down a well, probably by uh, early Christians trashing pagan uh, temples, that kind of thing. But there was enough information on the dark orange bits to figure out the rest. So I'll come right up close. So the, the bear and the dragons are in the middle, and then the circles around are two zodiac circles. And then the bigger circle around the very end, each zodiac sign is divided into three. And so 30 degrees for each zodiac sign, you have three decans. So they've got 10 degrees, 10 degrees, 10 degrees, three aspects of Taurus, three aspects of Gemini, three aspects of Cancer and so on. So with the, 36 decans, you're dividing the sun's path into 36, which is way more than the 20 of the Oum tree, you know, but just another example of how the sun's path is divided like that. So, mainly then today, because of uh, the Queen of the Heavens, so I'll come back to that one. I'll put this on the Facebook group as well. So there, in the middle, just angle it. It's like a W-shaped constellation, okay? Is one way of looking at it. I'll come to the other way of looking at it shortly. Um, and in Celtic artwork, that W shape is represented on a few different artifacts, okay? And simplistically, they were seen as the breasts or the heavenly boobies of, of the mother goddess, you know? And the, the way of representing that is with female figures doing this. They do this with their arms. And the arms are making the W shape. On, on, on the chest, if you like, you know, it's a, it's a nice, simple way of doing it. Now that's depicted on the famous Gunderstruck cauldron. Uh, one of the outer panels is a goddess figure and she's making that W shape with her arms, you know? 
and it's not unique to the Gunderstrup cauldron. There's a lovely little carved uh, plaque from Britain, Aquasulis, the Roman town of Bath. They found a small plaque, it's only about this big, <clears throat> and it's called the Three Mothers, or and that's what archaeologists have named it, the Three Mothers. So you can Google that too, just put the Three Mothers Aquasulis or Three Mothers Bath, and you'll find a picture of it. And they're very naive uh, depictions of three women side by side. It's quite damaged. So the, the first lady, if you're looking at, at them like this, this lady is quite damaged. You can't see her arms properly. But the one in the middle and the one on this side are both doing that uh, breast-shaped Cassiopeia constellation shape of the Great Mother. <clears throat> now, also on the Gunderstrup Cauldron, and this was brilliant. It was just totally mind-blowing to me when I, when I saw it. <clears throat> you get given gifts sometime, sometimes to back up your theories and stuff. So back to this then. So this is the winter constellation on the Milky Way. There's the W-shaped mother goddess in the middle. And then there's the three birds of the summer stars, okay? So when the summer stars are in the sky in the summertime at nighttime, the winter hunter and his hound are below the horizon. You can't, you can't see them, they're below the horizon. And equally in the winter time, um, when the hunter's in the sky, you can't see the three birds, they're, they're below the horizon, okay? So symbolically upside down. Now then, so if the three birds are in the sky, it's summertime and the winter hunter and hound have to be upside down. And that's what's depicted clear as day on the Gunderstrup cauldron. You can look it for yourself online. So it's the same figure. This time she's not making the W shape, but in her upraised hand, she's holding a little bird, Lyra, and on either side of her head are two bigger birds. So there's two big birds and a little bird. So it's the three birds of the winter constellation. But the wonderful confirmation is that below her breasts, there's a hunter and hound upside down. So that's the winter stars below the horizon upside down whilst the three birds are above. And she's the same figure that was making the W shape with her arms there. Wonderful, brilliant stuff. You know, a confirmation, if you like. And that we'll come back to um, the constellation Cassiopeia from a Celtic perspective in a little while. Now, I just want to talk about the other way of looking at that constellation. So on the one hand, like this, uh, it's a W, but when it's seen sideways, like this, the kind of sideways view of it, the W becomes a throne or a chair. And it's that as well in the Bardic tradition, but more importantly in, in uh, Greek mythology, it is the goddess queen Cassiopeia chained to the heavenly throne. But even more importantly, is that it's the throne of Isis as the queen of heaven, you know, and in Egyptian iconography, the, the headdress of Isis is the throne and the throne is Cassiopeia, the constellation, or the throne is the queen of the heavens and Isis wears that on her crown, you know, the name Isis itself means throne, you know? So on the one hand, Isis is literally wearing the heavenly throne on her headdress, but equally when there's, you know, Virgin Mary and Jesus, Isis and Horus type, of, type of iconography, 
she is breastfeeding her child as well, you know. So again, it's the it's the heavenly mother and the heavenly breasts, or it's the throne of the queen of heaven. Either way, it's the same constellation in the ever present circumpolar stars, not the stars that come and go, you know, they're ever present. And that's the important thing there. So here's another one that I found recently. I managed to get it in the book. I found it just in time to put in this book. And it was found in Gaul. It's dated to the third century. And simplistically, it's a female queen figure um, and a bear. So people, you know, early, early archeologists said, oh, it's um, the bear goddess. And a lot of people see it as a bear goddess. And there is an inscription that says something like uh, Arteus or Arteu, which is uh, the, the goddess of the bear or something like that. But yes, but it's more than that. It's the goddess sitting on a throne next to a great bear. And that's your central stars again, that's Cassiopeia and Ursa Major. And the tree, I would say, is symbolic of the pole axis, you know? So again, yes, simplistically bear goddess, but on a deeper level, it's a wonderful, brilliant depiction of the circumpolar stars is what it is as well. You know, the heavenly bear is there with the goddess on the W-shaped throne, queen of heaven. So then, <clears throat> from a Welsh, mythological perspective. Uh, in the 1800s, some Welsh star law was finally written down by Welsh societies of London. And we know some basic constellations from them. And Cassiopeia, the constellation, was the constellation known in North Wales as Llys Don, which is the court of Don. Uh, Don is the mother goddess. Uh, in Ireland, she's Danu, you know. So you've, in Ireland, you've got the Duada de Danan, and in Britain, you had the children of Don. Don is the mother goddess. But again, her constellation is Cassiopeia. Simplistically, um, the Milky Way was literally seen as the lactation of the central breasts in the night sky, if you like. Um, the Brythonic equivalent of Brigid in Northern Britain was the goddess Brigantia. And she's depicted, very Romanized, fair enough. She's, she's depicted like Minerva with a spear and a shield and a helmet and stuff. But by her feet, there's a sacred stone called an omphalos. And the omphalos represents a navel or the, the center point of a kingdom. Or simplistically, it's the very center of a sacred precinct, if you like. And on other altarpieces to Brigantia, she is actually referred to as celestial as well. So if you combine the two bits of archaeology, it's a naval center point of a celestial goddess, you know? So Brigid or Brigantia, both the name means literally the high one, <laughs> the, the high one at the center of everything. You know, she's celestial, she's the central omphalos, she's the high one, you know? And, and so Bridey, Brigid, Brigantia with the, was well, simplified into St. Bridget and the milking of cows or something, you know, but that, that, da that dairy thing was always there, albeit slightly changed. Now, another one that's really interesting is um, the goddess that pops up in Gaul and in Britain and she's proper archaeology. I don't know if you'll be able to see this very well. This was found in Gloucestershire. It's a pencil drawing, but the original thing is a stone carving. 
and it's Mercury, the god Mercury, but he's with the goddess Rosmerta. Now, the iconography that goes with Rosmerta is this bucket and a ladle in her hand. She's got a ladle and a bucket. And, and this led um, simple archaeology to kind of look at Mercury as a god of trade and wealth and, and maybe trickster things. And, and that Rosmerta was some sort of domestic goddess milkmaid. They, they thought that her bucket was for um, churning milk into butter or, or something like that, you know. So there's a, a lot written about Rosmerta. Her name means great provider or distributor. Uh, that's what her name means in proto-Celtic uh, European language, uh, the great provider. But anyway, so think about it this way then. So you've got the, as planet Earth is spinning, for us standing on planet Earth, it creates the optical illusion that the stars are spinning. The stars appear to be rotating and we're stationary. Actually, it's us spinning. And, and, but anyway, this stirring, this stirring of the heavenly kingdom, it seems to rotate. You know, the stars stir, turn around every night. So this is heavenly stirring. So then what you have here is the heavenly queen. And although the little bear's there and Draco, the dragon is there, the little bear and Draco are relatively faint. They're not so obvious to see. Whereas the big dipper or Ursa Major, the great bear, is vibrant, it, you can't miss it. It's the, the W shape and the Big Dipper, you can see on the really poor quality night, you can see those, you know, that's harder to see the other constellations. So anyway, the mother at the center of the stirring of the night sky with her Big Dipper or ladle, you know? So back to Rosmerta with her bucket and her ladle, you know, this is the heavenly goddess that does the stirring of, of the heavenly realm, if you like, you know. So it's not just making butter out of milk, you know, that she is this heavenly great mother and her tool is this big dipper, this, this heavenly ladle, you know, as well. Which then, you then have to think again about um, stories like, Keridwen and her cauldron and the young lad that eventually becomes Taliesin, Gwion, stirring her cauldron for a year and a day, you know, it's all there in those stories. So, you know, if this, there is this heavenly matriarch and she has a big cauldron that needs stirring constantly, you know, and that's there in the Taliesin story too. So I think I've waffled enough. There are obscure poems credited to Taliesin and he actually talks, I can't remember the perfect quote of it, but he actually says, I've been this, I've been that. I was there at the, when Adam and Eve were doing whatever. And he also says, I have sat on the seat of the distributor. I have sat on the throne of the great provider, you know, that it's those Milky Way references to points, you know, and he would know he, he as Guion, he stirred Keridwen's cauldron for a whole year, you know, so when you start getting a grasp onto these star stories, the Celtic mythology start to come alive, they start to, you can see reading between the lines what bards were hinting at. You know, they know what they're talking about, but they're not. It's there as esoteric metaphors that, that they're saying, you know. Um, yes. So how do you use that? We can talk about that in a minute. Um, so in your medicine wheel, in your sacred grove, in your sacred circle, if you're standing, meditating, maybe doing the three cauldrons meditation or just whatever, you know, but your spine 
or your activities in the center of your grove align with those central stars, be it the great mother or the dragon or the great bear or the little bear, you know, all of that is always present in the center point of your sacred circle. Okay, so uh, you can turn your microphones on and we'll discuss all of that. <clears throat> I'll keep recording for YouTube. Um, Thank you very much, Larry. That was, that was excellent, as always. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of this idea of <clears throat> we have these mortal lives. <clears throat> we have these mortal lives and these immortal spirits. And I think <clears throat> the constellations and these stories are telling us things about our immortal spirit. And uh, those, those are what Jung called the archetypes that are in alchemy related to the, uh, like, you know, this, this modern idea, we, all the heavy metals in our bodies were forged in the stars. So we have these, these qualities that come from the stars inside of us. And, and we can think of them as like instincts or impulses or the effect of endocrine systems on our emotions. These are urging us in, in directions that are um, covered by these stories, these mythologies that are seen in the constellations. And they're addressing the more, the, the qualities of, the, of our humanness that, that are just unchanging. Even though culture changes, there are certain things going on as humans that just don't really change or they change so slowly. It's as slow as the movement of the heavens in the procession. I think with the with the OM gatherings we've been doing, we've been following the trees <clears throat> with the turning of the year, and that's always on the circumference. It's never dealing with the center point. In you know? so there, there never was a perfect time to talk about the center point, but I thought it was worth doing. Um, yeah, definitely. And I just love that, you know, you've got mythology from North Wales and you've got iconography on the Gunderstrup cauldron. They're worlds apart, really. They're both Celtic, but then they're, they're many centuries apart as well as across different countries. But it, they've still got the same emphasis of the W-shaped constellation. And then you get a little plaque in Roman bath in near Bristol of ladies doing this, you know, representing that, you know, and then realizing that it's also Isis and Cassiopeia, that this is, it's across the Northern European Europe, really, and Mediterranean. I think you've really cracked the code there, you know, where, where the archaeologists are making these simplistic interpretations. You recognize them as the constellations, which is, you know, a much more uh, relevant mythological um, guiding principle. What's that background? Is it somebody's radio or something on? I think it's someone's speaker. I know it's it's irritating. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whose speaker it is. It's someone with a microphone on. Yeah. Better now. Better yeah, now. Yeah. 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 You know what I I wanted to ask you also, Yuri, because didn't Catherine Maltwood do like was it the mother that you did the painting where she's but she's got her legs up and she like this, right? Oh right. Yes. Yeah. And um, wasn't it called the mother? The mother. Magna Magna Magna. Magna. Yeah. yeah, she's she's kind of hugging her knees. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, it reminded me of that. Definitely. And and the other thing was that that Draco, you know, it, it must have something to do with like the dragon's head and the dragon's tail, which is the eclipses. Yeah. Right. That there must be some connection to that because the eclipses are that you know, go around 
you know, they last 12 to 1500 years, you know, they're major collective cycles. And so when you were talking, I was like, oh, that has that it's got to have something to do with the dragon's head and the dragon's tail. And, you know, and, and also that it's biting of the tail in the I never know how to pronounce the O-Familians or whatever. I might like. yeah. um, in the Old Testament, you have the Moses story with the brazen serpent, you know, and that's that's Bronze Age symbol again, where, where you've got this kind of tau cross thing. And, and um, that's carried <laughs> through into Freemasonry and stuff. But it goes, goes back to the Old Testament is, is what it is. And it is draco the dragon nailed to the pole axis uh this is my set square for drawing but it, that's what it looks like you know it's just stuck to this single cross and uh there is a certain time of the year i, I can't think of it off the top of my head but i think it's to do when uh we're in cancer or leo roughly that the constellation of hydra the water serpent is just below the horizon. So you've got a, a water dragon in the earth connected to a heavenly dragon in the pole star area. In, and they're actually aligned then, you know, there's so dragon above, dragon below at that certain time of year. So there's a kind of double <laughs> dragon thing going on there. Oh, heaven and earth. A mirror in the sky. Yeah. And, and I think we should mention the, the Kundalini that, you know, what's going on in heaven and earth is mirrored in what's going on in, in the human being. And, and at the base of the spine, there's a serpent that is in a knot and asleep. And if it, if it wakes up, then, then we will become aware of our cosmic and eternal presence that otherwise is asleep. And in terms of the, the uh, eclipse cycle, you know, we, we have the unconscious where we dream, but we're, we're not really not aware of what this dream life is. And then we have the solar conscious, which we're very much aware of. And these things are, are you know, night and day, night and day. But maybe with the awakening of the Kundalini, we would expect that, you know, it becomes more of a, uh, what uh, a little uh, less less divided, you know, a little more of a magical awareness when we're awake that we have this other life going on in the unconscious. At the beginning of this, when I wasn't recording, you were asking about the standing for the qigong exercises. <clears throat> And to my mind, I mean, this isn't authentic Chinese teaching or anything, but to my mind, when, when you're standing in a meditational pose and you've got your lower cauldron, your middle cauldron and your upper cauldron, and they're nicely aligned, then what are you doing? Literally, you're, you know, you're plugging into earth itself and your upper cauldron is aligning with the central stars. You know, so if you're standing in meditation, you're drawing down whatever you want to draw down, be it the dragon or the goddess or, or, or whatever, you know, but th those eternal presences are there that you can literally connect heaven and earth uh, all year round, no, ma no matter which tree the sun is visiting, that that's always there. So whatever magic you do, it is worth at least acknowledging the eternal presence of the goddess, the dragon and the two bears in, in, in however you want to incorporate it. But that, that is literally what's above any Northern hemisphere magic workings. Mm -hmm. So Isis ever present in that way, or from a Celtic perspective, Rosmerta or Brigantia. It, it makes so much more alchemical sense of the heavens than, than just kind of random stories. You know, suddenly it becomes a really coherent metaphysical alchemical story of human transformation from a mortal to an immortal awareness. You know, in the Mabinogian, albeit it's late, what is it, it's like 13th century or something, but there's this, there is that story 
of Leith bringing down the dragons to the center of his kingdom. So that dragon energy to the center point, I think is the main emphasis there. Now, going back to 50 BC, when Julius Caesar is writing about his conquest of Gaul, he describes the Druids of Gaul gathering every year at the center of their kingdom, you know? So you could easily put two and two together and imagine that the Druids doing dragon something at the center of Gaul, you know? Because that's what's carried on in the stories. And, and the Gunderstrup Cauldron proves that Celtic stories cross many lands and tell the same thing, you know, whether it's a cauldron of renewal or a W-shaped breasted goddess figure, you know, it's the same. So drawing dragon energy or kundalini energy up and down the spinal cord whilst you're meditating was a perfect symbol of medicine and magicians, isn't it? You know, that's, that's what it is. And, and our central nervous system, which is simply our sensory system, not the processing of emotions or the thinking of the mind, but just the processing of our senses, that's the serpent brain. That's the, uh, like, our central nervous system is equivalent to a, the evolution of a serpent's nervous system. So, like, when, you're, when your emotions and your mind are uh, not contaminated by karmas or by false impressions, you know, by, by crazy modern commercialism, but you're just like in nature, totally tuned into nature. Uh, this is the serpent energy, you know, it's just one with nature, yeah. awakened. Sometimes I wonder about all these titles, you know, and like, um, not to be disrespectful, but like titles and um, imagery and kundalini. And, and then I think about like people that just live out in the woods and they really don't have, they, th their church is just the woods. They love the woods. Mm. We can't hear you. Mana, we can't hear you. You're going to guess whether you're in the, you know, if your Hawthorne tree is like from England or if it's from like some part of like the East Coast of America or if, you know, it's like the stars aren't going to lie and their, their movements may change, but they're still the same entity. And so... Um, I don't know. I just feel how it just amazes me how astronomy fits in so well with this work as in Druidry, you know, it's just so precise. There's no, there's no lying in it. There's no like uh, hypotheses. Those stars are always there. And, and maybe, maybe, I, I mean, maybe I should take back what I said in this in a way, because, you know, then I think, well, you know, the reason why we have these stories are because they relate to the stars and that's how they passed down tradition and that's how the ancient wisdom was kept. I don't know. I'm thinking out loud. Sorry. <laughs> I think that's right, though. I think that's how stories are passed on to each generation. And yeah. maybe, maybe with certain rites of passage, deeper levels of meaning are put to the stories. Yeah. But fairy tales. To like, like, right. Like the indigenous people, all the indigenous people. Oh my God. I hear so many st stories about, you know, the Olam or the Star Lord. And I, I, it goes, it's like Yurok stories, Kurok stories, Paiute stories. They're all kind of, they all kind of have the same sort of thread of truth to them. It's interesting because they're earth. Again. Manu, we can't hear you. All stars in the night sky, and then there's the inspiration that circles around and is brought forth through all of that. So you have the three cauldrons right there. It's pretty. 
pretty, I don't know, I'm thinking a lot again, sorry. <laughs> it's cool. Uh, I just want to mention work. one more thing, because I'd written it down and I forgot to mention it, that there is another goddess as well. And there's many place names throughout Europe and the British Isles that remember her. And in modern archaeology, they call her Nematona. Mm. And Nematona is just another title. It just means she of the sacred grove. And there's lots of places with Nematona's name in one variation or another applied to it. So I would suggest that if you see the Owen Grove as a sacred circle, then she of the sacred grove would also be the, the heavenly goddess at the center point. So kind of shining down a presence into the grove. Mana, can you mute? Sorry. We need to sort out Mana's um, speaker or, or whatever. Get, get her some headphones. I have some bells that ring in the background and I forget. It, it, we, we would probably add that even though the stars are telling this eternal story, there are moments when uh, things like seasons are, are shifting, when one age drifts into the next age, and when the, what's called the solar dom dominant or the image of the sun and the image of the moon are changing masks. And so there's a crisis period when, when the one old mask is becoming corrupt, ready to leave, and a new one is just being born in the crisis of, of you know, initiation. Uh, those are initiations for the whole human, well, for the whole world, for all, all beings. And we're in that stage right now between the age of Pisces, which is amazingly the 12th house, the, the end of the cycle, and Aquarius, which is the 11th age, uh, but yeah, here we are. Uh, it's, it's a long twilight zone, but as, as Yuri has illuminated um, in, in other weeks, that with Aquarius comes the divine feminine, the holy grail, the return of the intuitive, the return of the heart-centered dominant, which, you know, I think we, we, we can put some hope in that there's hope in that, you know, that that the, when the heart begins to guide humanity, if it can clear up its confusion and delusion and deceptions, um, you know, there's great hope that, that we, we will be in a better place when we're guided by our hearts more than our heads. I was looking for the drawing I did of Brigantia, but I can't find it. Um, Oh, I've got it here. This is black and white. There is a color version on the internet, but following on from what um, Franklin was just saying, uh, this is meant to be an icon of Bridey, Brigid, Brigantia, but I used the circumpolar symbols. So on her breasts, I gave her the W shape. And the, there's um, a big bear there and a little bear in the bottom and it looks like he's breaking wind to a star but that's the <laughs> that's the, that's the pole star there at, relating to the little bear and i don't know if you can see it but going up her sphere there's a serpent twist yes. and that's, that's meant to acknowledge draco uh, at the center point but um the reason saying brigid bridey is the celtic goddess of the aquarian age is because her festival of Imbolc, 1st of February or just after, happens during Aquarius every year. So when you've got an Aquarian age that lasts for 2,600 years or something, oh. halfway through it, there will be a cosmic Imbolc, you know? Oh, that's beautiful. Beyond our lifetimes, but... From a Celtic perspective, then, you know, as much as Jesus has been a major icon in the Piscean age, 
Bridey Brigid Brigantia is the divine presence for the Aquarian age from a Celtic perspective, you know, and, and if it is Brigantia with a heavenly throne at the center point, then by default, it's also Isis is queen of heaven for the Aquarian age, you know, it's, it's all there. Uh, and it's all there written in the stars. And the, I often think that, you know, I think about the library of ancient Alexandria being trashed and burnt uh, and, and statues and iconography being smashed and burnt. And uh, the stars, the constellations can never be destroyed. You know, that they're, they're, they're icons that no religious extremism can destroy they can't destroy what's written in the stars is written in the stars you know and it's the stories that keep it alive isn't it you know yeah. and they're natural and organic because they're seasonal stories or they're ever-present stars and, and i would add we have these electrochemical synapses in our brain you know these these are like little packets of chemicals that when when a little signal hits they boom they spark another signal to the next neuron so there's this whole sparkling galaxy in our head and it's literally a mirror of the great cosmic intelligence of the creators <clears throat> so the intelligence you know it doesn't it what it's it's yes it exists in time but exists exists out of time as well it exists in eternity <clears throat> and it's it's intelligent emotion it's emotional intelligence i think um i think it was good to do this before we do the middle cauldron so like we've already you, if you go on the youtube channel you can look up a video clip for the three cauldrons the lower cauldron and the upper cauldron and i decided not to do the middle cauldron until later in the summer and there's star law reasons for that but I really think that these circumpolar stars, these central stars are also the heavenly presence in the middle cauldron. And, and it's good to, or you draw that down just like Druids bringing down dragon energy or whatever, you know, that the queen of heaven is there inside you in your middle bowl always as well. Yeah, it's just, just to share sort of my thoughts on this. I think the thing that's really exciting about this for me is how I've never learned about anything like to do with this, but going out into nature, um, like my practice for like ritual and how I connect with nature has come really organically for me. And then when I've actually started researching it, the practices that I would do that I'm doing and the way that I'm celebrating those, are mirrored back at me in like ancient teachings and things that have come really naturally to me it's like I'm connecting with that like Celtic mythology um and it is like that sort of wisdom that's in all of us and for me that's what's so powerful about this like learning that it's like you just look at the stars and that's you know that's our story that's our ancestral story and it's mirrored through all cultures and all ancient belief systems it's like you can't deny it and the more you look into it the more it's like oh wow we are actually surrounded by this and it connects all humans all over the world and I think that's what's so powerful about it like sort of new religions they just don't make sense <laughs> whereas <laughs> This, you, you can't deny it because it's it's in the trees, it's in the seasons, it's in the stars. And uh, yeah, I just find that really powerful the way it's all mirrored back. If you imagined going way back in time, say thousands of years and you were in a tribe, you would be living pretty much one rather small area um, and there would be no light pollution and the landscape all around you you would gradually learn year by year with your parents and grandparents that the winter hunter comes up over those hills in the winter time and the summer birds come up over those hills in the summer time and it would be a living presence of gods and goddesses all around you every night every night that the 
the divine ones would be looking down on you and your landscape and you would just know it you, you know it wouldn't be something to learn it would just be you and the intimacy of your homeland and actually you can go all over the northern hemisphere of the planet and it's the same stars anyway you know um, but you would have learned it growing up with your village you know but the uh, Nowadays, I mean, I'm st I still meet Jim, people, uh, what, what, sorry, I still meet people that can't recognize individual trees, you know, so that's how divorced they are. And equally, I, I, I can't recognize every constellation, but there's, there's, there's a lot I do know now. And it's amazing how most people just don't really know one constellation from another. And, and they might know zodiac signs like Libra and Scorpio, but they wouldn't recognize it in the sky. They just know it as an idea, you know. I, I was going to say that that Young Young told us to recreate the ancient in a new iteration. So you know the New Testament. It turns out you know there's an esoteric way to read the New Testament. It's the ancient Testament simply with new names, new figures but you can match them up and realize, oh, this is just a reiteration of the same characters, but then we can recognize they're the constellations, you know? And this is a new sun that comes out, the lamb is sacrificed, the lamb, and then the fish is reborn, a new, uh, you know, a resurrection of the, of the fisher of men. So it's going from the Aries to the Piscean age. And now we're going from the Aquarian age to the, uh, or rather from the Piscean age to the Aquarian age. And, and, and so we are encouraged to create uh, iterations of these ancient stories in ways that are, that are you know, relevant and meaningful, uh, that are helpful, uh, but, but recognizing that talking about archetypes that are our own emotional powers, our own emo uh, qualities of being human. Can you, can you see this, Yuri? This, what I'm trying to show here is that the, yeah. the, the, processional, the processional circle in the sky rests on the Milky Way galaxy, and, and it's as if it's a wheel spinning like a gear. And, and that W is Cassiopeia, where, where the procession ah. circle touches the Milky Way. Uh, and and we're, we're right at this um, perpendicular to the axis of the procession. So this is maybe why the 12th age ends where it does, because it doesn't begin there. It ends, this was the whole idea of the Mayan Bakhtun, was yeah. these are perpendicular. And it's as if these are gears. The Milky Way is going that way, and the wheel is spinning like that, like it's geared into the Milky Way. Check that out. Yeah, and is that the pole star processions? Uh, this is the this is this is the pole star on this side. This is the axis of procession in Draco at the center. Yeah. So that would be what the dragon is holding, the center of the processional circle. Ah, uh, yes. Polaris is perpendicular if we make the Milky Way the base. Yeah. We see the Milky Way as, as the foundation. The procession is like a wheel turning like a gear on top of it. And our axis of the Earth right now is perpendicular to the axis of the processional circle. So, you know, like, uh, like when the pyramids were built, we were on top of the procession. But the pole was pointing, you know, as high from the from the Milky Way as it will, then it comes down and it gets perpendicular to the axis of precession. That's where we are. Now, as we process, we're gonna be moving in the same direction as the star stream. So for the last 13,000 years, we've been moving, we've been processing against the star stream. Now, as of 2012 or 1998, literally, uh, we're gonna, move into the star stream again so you know is there a physical is there something physical to that i don't know but there's certainly something symbolic there that we can see how you know we're, we're back in line with the milky way back in line with the the milk of, of compassion milk of human kindness 
And, and I'll, the, I'll draw some better drawings for you and I'll send them to you. Oh, yeah. and then, yeah. I don't know what you said, but it made me think of, you know, that the processions and the um, the nodes, the eclipses are all going retrograde backwards instead of, right? I don't know what you, you said something and it just kind of like, oh yeah. You were talking about the wheel going backwards or something? Yeah, like if, if you know, there's a star stream, the whole galaxy is turning and there's something called the star stream. There's a general direction in which, in which this is being pulled around the black hole at the center. And, uh, and, and as the earth wobbles, it's like a wheel that dips in and out of the plane of the galaxy. And so if the, if the star stream is going that way, see, we go up, then we go in the opposite direction, then we go back into the direction, up and out against it, then back into it. We're right there, where we're changing all polarity or phase and training out to the galaxy. Yeah, I think that's why the end of the 12th age is now. I think that's, you know, the whole 26,000 year circle. Why does, why does the end of the 12th age come here? Why does the first stage touch the, why does the first and last stages touch 2000 years ago? Does it make any sense? It makes sense when you see the end of the 12th age coming with this big galactic thing that, that you know, this is what the 2012 Maya calendar was all about. This is a, you know, a really significant cosmic image or, or pattern that, that is not something they made up. It's something that you can observe. It's real, it's, it's objective. You know, Yuri, you, um, <clears throat> this, this is a little more on astronomy. Um, one thing here in Southern California, we're at about 33 degrees latitude. And when we drive up to Isis Oasis or to see Mana, she lives at about 38 degrees latitude. So in one day, we, we make a long drive out of it. And in one day, we drive far enough across the globe that um, down here, the Big Dipper is not circumpolar. Um, and in one day, we drive up to where it becomes circumpolar. So we can, so I can, it, it'll set here. Then I, I can drive up and then go out at night. And there's, there's the Big Dipper above the horizon. Mm -hmm. Cassiopeia is circumpolar here uh, in, in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And another thing you mentioned about us being divorced from nature, not knowing the constellations, not knowing the trees. And even in the, um, among amateur astronomers, I started studying astronomy more than 50 years ago when I was a kid. So I learned a lot of the constellations so you would know where to find, where to point your telescope, you know, where to find Lyra and, and you know, maybe the ring nebula or whatever object you're looking for. And a lot of modern telescopes are electronic and computerized. So you can dial in the object or you can dial in the coordinates. And a lot of my understanding is a lot of the younger um, amateur astronomers, you know, going back 30 or more years, don't even know the constellations anymore because they don't need to. A little bit like not knowing your, the way around your city because you have GPS in your car. So even in the science of astronomy, a lot of, a lot of amateurs are further divorced from the constellations than we were a generation ago. And, and that's an interesting parallel, I think, on kind of on the scientific front to your, your comment on the spiritual uh, and um, cultural front. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think with the Celtic worldview, you're dealing with different periods of history. So like the Iron Age star observer, observing, it, it is things like the W shape and Cassiopeia and its dragon law and its winter, winter stars and su summer stars. There isn't really evidence to say the Celts saw it as the 12 signs of the ecliptic. They, 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 but they were looking at star groups, winter stars, summer stars, W in the middle, that kind of thing. And then when you get to late medieval times with what I call the Bardic tradition, through the church, they've absorbed astrology and, and the 12 signs of the zodiac. And they're, they're still Celtic star law, but it's a different shape of things to the Iron Age perspective with their artwork. 
sort of thing, but it's all really interesting. And I, I know from, I mean, I don't have the knowledge, but there's people on the Owen Grove Facebook group that want to study the Owen, and I'm talking about Northern Hemisphere star law, and they live in Australia and stuff, you know, and I can't help them. What they have to do is learn their circumpolar stars and their winter and summer stars, and then work with those. You know, I, I only know the Northern European perspective of the sky from the archaeology, really, you know. So when you get towards the equator, yeah, all the rules change, of course, you know. Right, equatorial uh, cultures don't even have circumpolar stars to speak of. <laughs> <laughs> if you live right on the equator, you have no circumpolar stars. The pole star is on the horizon. And then, of course, as you said, in the southern hemisphere, it's a completely different set of stars and different mythology. Yeah. The all, you know, you could take the observations we've made and you could live in Australia and start fixing things together. You know, what are your summer stars, winter stars? What are your circumpolar stars? What do the Aborigine people say about the central stars, you know? and incorporate that into your modern druidry or, or whatever, you know? Wherever you are on the planet, you've got to work within your circumference and the stars above you, mm -hmm. don't you? You know, and get to know your neck of the woods is how it works. There's, there's something of a crisis because in the 19th century, when so much of the astronomy was really in ascendancy and they were establishing the official star charts, they were not mythologists. And, and when the sailors from Europe went down into the Southern Hemisphere and they started to create uh, better star maps, they really weren't thinking mythologically. So we have a lot of things down there that are just technological things like compasses and sextants and you know, which maybe you could make a mythology out of it, but but it would be wise to go to Southern Africa and Australia and find out what are the Aborigines talking about? What is their mythology? You have to go back to ancestral wisdom and, yeah. and, and that's it, you know, and, and hope they're willing to share, you know. Yeah. But the Break other thing pain. is then regardless of your, regardless of whether you're living in the North or the South of the planet, Planet Earth itself, when it's in Taurus, it looks like the sun is in Scorpio, you know, so the, the Earth has a relationship to the sun's ecliptic, whether you're north or south, it doesn't matter, you know, but, but your circumpolar stars are very different if you're north or south. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. We need, you know, yeah. we need a convergence of wizards to create a, a, an official sacred star map because what they did in the 19th century, you know, they were, I think, consciously not doing anything sacred. They, they were not looking at the, at the ecliptic as, you know, 12 equal houses. They were just dividing it, you know, I think rather haphazardly. Yeah. And, and so that leaves the astrologers and those interested in sacred astronomy and, and when is the age of Aquarius to, to try to sort it out because we're not gonna necessarily find it unless we just say, well, the way they did it has some meaning, has some, something that we'll find out when we get there. We can't see it from where we are, but when we get there, we'll realize, oh, wow, they did this just intuitively and it makes sense. And then it's it's not really an equal pie, like 30 degrees each sign, right? No. You know, that's why astrology is mythological and is because, you know, people say that to me. It's like the Vedics say, oh, we've got it because we're aligned to the stars, but they still separated into these little, you know, 30 or they've got the lunar mansions and things. But, you know, it doesn't actually work like that. I mean, you know, right? The, the astronomy, I mean, they're not just like, like Virgo's huge, right? Yeah. And yeah. Libra is just like the claws of the scorpion, right? Well, constellations are different to zodiac signs. A, a sign is 30 degrees wide, but it's right. a man-made man grid, 
Right, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's what I mean. I know yeah. the deck hands. Yeah. Well, it's like the constellation of Cancer the Crab. It's a tiny little thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. so the, the 12 signs were named after constellations, okay. you know. Okay. But none of the constellations, well, the constellations aren't all 30 degrees. Oh, exactly. The, know, signs, the signs are a period of time. Right. And the constellations are, you know, things in the sky. And, and 2,000 years ago, they were allegedly, you know, lined up. Right. Exactly. And then we wobbled, right? Yeah. And then we start, yeah, that's slow. And, and, you know, I mean, I don't know what other people think, but, I, you know, I, I know a lot of people, and I believe that um, the asteroid belt, now I heard from someone else that it was two planets, not mm -hmm. one. And I had only heard that this one, and you know, and that the, uh, that like set the wobble. It's like the, that we're like really we're fragmented because we're not really because we're wobbling. I don't know if that's true, but anyways, that's what I that's what I what comes to me. I feel fragmented because. <laughs> really interesting, possibly. You know, it's a really interesting question because. because there's such an elegant nature to this procession of the equinox. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but it, if it's random, it's one of those random things that makes you say, there, there's an intelligence going on here. Like this is an intelligent cosmos. I don't wanna invoke intelligent design in, in that crazy Christian fundamentalist sense, but the design of the cosmos has so much synchronicity and intelligence in it that uh, you can't deny it. You know, it's the, the numbers don't lie. It's it's an intelligent design. Yeah. And I think the procession amplifies that. <clears throat> but but I'd, I'd have to think about it to explain what I'm talking about. What did we just let into the center of the grove? <laughs> you know, um, so. Uh, working magically within a sacred space is so much more than just its circumference, isn't it? You know, and connecting with the above and connecting the above to the below. I guess that's our job as intermediaries or shaman or druids or whatever, you know, that we're, we hold the middle space between heaven and earth and what have you. We're out of time. I just want to ask Shell. Oh, he studied astronomy for 50 years about the asteroid belt because you know this is really what are there millions of like fragmented asteroids millions i, I think there are millions going down to you know, little tiny grains yes. um there are a handful of larger objects that are you know a couple hundred miles in diameter and series the largest one i think is um about 500 miles in diameter something like that so it's, it's the belt between Mars and Jupiter and takes yeah. up the space in the solar system where a planet would might have formed had they had they uh, coalesced into a planet. Yeah. So do you yeah, because do you, do you not think that, that it was a planet? I, I don't know. I personally um, I think astronomers think it, it never was one that it didn't break up that I, I think what they're thinking is that it never um, never got together to become a planet. I think it's leftover debris. Well, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I disagree. And um, because I, I do believe it was a planet uh -huh. and, um, and that, that it kind of knocked things off that, you know, whatever. But anyways, a lot of people feel that way. I'm not the only one. This brings us to the intelligent design. It was discovered because uh, um, I forget the astronomer, but he predicted it would be there. And, it, and it's it's in the scale of the harmonics of music. The planets fall into musical harmonics and there should be a planet there. And then lo and behold, they discovered a bunch of little ones, but it's right there where I guess, the, you know, the key of D would be or something like that. Oh, well, that's interesting. I never <clears> that. Yeah, now, who's, the, who's the astronomer? Not Fibonacci, but uh, wow. Not Kepler. Yeah, I was just reading it too recently. Yeah, I can't think of his name. I should know it. But. I, I'd be interested if, if you find out. Yeah, but it, it points to intelligent design or, or this idea that, you know, musical harmonics, beautiful art, the whole, it just pervades the universe. The great creator is the greatest artist ever. And we're like little 
fractals of that. If, if we're living up to our potential, we should be great artists. <laughs> Yuri, you're doing pretty good. Yeah, Yuri's doing good. Thank you, Yuri. Good night, Yuri, for coming. Thanks for, coming. Thanks for, you. Thanks for joining Jeff and Katana. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, nice to meet Bye. you. Nice to meet everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Now. Bye.